And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the awards ceremony where the National Academy of Sciences is going to recognize 19 individuals for their outstanding contributions to science. This ceremony is being webcast live, and so we welcome our viewers from the U.S. and abroad. Now, nomination details for awards to be presented in 2020 are already available on our website. So if your favorite candidate is not going to be honored up here on the stage today, this is your chance to get in a nomination for next year. Our evaluation panels are always happy to see highly qualified new candidates. And remember, these do not need to be members of the National Academy. We love to honor outstanding scientists who are not members of the Academy and get them up here and tell them how much we value their contributions to science. Now, uh, the first prizes we give out are the Cazzarelli Prizes. During the PNAS editorial board meeting, six papers that were published in PNAS in 2018 were awarded the Cazzarelli Prize. The Cazzarelli Prize is named in honor of our late and beloved editor-in-chief, Nicholas R. Cazzarelli. These papers were published in PNAS and were recognizing their outstanding scientific excellence and originality. Uh, there's one paper chosen for each of the six academy classes. The full list of authors can be found in your programs. I'd like to announce the prize-winning papers and ask the authors here today to stand and be acknowledged. So for class one in physical and mathematical sciences, the authors are Alexei A. Melnikov, Hendrik Poulsen Nautrop, Mario Kren, Vendran Dunchko, Marcus Tiersch, Anton Seilinger, and Hans J. Brengel. Uh, and it's for the paper, Active Learn Machine Learning Learns to Create New Quantum Experiments. The next is for class two, biological sciences. Uh, and the authors are Samuel Hong, S. Sunita, Tatsuya Mahagachi, Eric D. Hoffer, Jack A. Dunkel, and Christine N. Dunham. And they're being honored for their paper Mechanism of tRNA mediated plus one ribosomal frame shifting. <laughs> Class three is engineering and applied sciences, and uh, the prize winning authors are Gregory P. Smith, Tommaso P. Fracha. Marco Tedisco, Giuliano Zanchetta, Chenhui Su, Emily Hayden, Tommaso Bellini, and Noel A. Clark. And the name of the paper is Backbone Free Duplex Stacked Monomer Nucleic Acids Exhibiting Watson Crick Selectivity. Now, class four, biomedical sciences, bear with me. There are 24 authors on this paper. Uh, okay, so here are the authors. Natalie Cloutier, Isabelle Allais, Genevieve Marcou, Kelly R. Maclis, Benoit Mayu, Anne Soufri, Tanya Levesque, Jan Becker, Nicola Tessandier, 
Iman Melki, Win Z, Guy Poirier, Matthew T. Rodina, Joseph E. Italiano, Louis Flamand, Stephen E. McKenzie, Franson Cote, Bernard Neswant, Wei Yul I. Khan, Matthew J. Flick, Peter J. Newman, Steve Lacroix, Paul R. Fortin, and Eric Boilard. And it's for their paper, Platelets Release Pathogenic Serotonin and Return to Circulation After Immune Complex Mediated Sequestration. Class five is behavioral and social sciences. The authors are Alexander T.J. Barron, Jenny Huang, Rebecca Sprang, and Simon Dudeo for the paper, Individuals, Institutions, and Innovation in the Debates of the French Revolution. And last of the Cazzarelli Prizes, but surely not least, is Class 6, Applied Biological, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences. And the authors are Jonathan S. Lefchek, Robert J. Orth, William C. Dennison, David J. Wilcox, Rebecca R. Murphy, Murphy I'm sorry, Jennifer Kiesman, Cassie Gerbiz, Michael Hannon, Brooke Landry, Kenneth A. Moore, Christopher J. Patrick, Jeremy Testa, Donald E. Weller, and Richard A. Batuk. For the paper, long-term nutrient reductions lead to the unprecedented recovery of a temperate coastal region. So congratulations to all the Cazzarelli Prize winners. Now we're on to our other awards. And the first is the Comstock Prize in Physics. This will be introduced by Margaret M. Murnane, who's chair of the selection committee. Thank you, Marcia. And it is my great pleasure today to introduce the 2019 Comstock Prize in Physics being awarded to Professor Mikhail Lipson of Columbia University. Um, Mikhail is an exceptionally creative scientist whose research spans the physical and engineering sciences. And she is being honored today for her pioneering contributions to silicon photonics based on high confinement optical structures, including the demonstration of electro-optic modulation in silicon parametric oscillation, and extreme confinement of light in waveguides. Welcome, Mikhail. I'm grateful for the generations of students that joined me. They joined the quest to completely revolutionize the way we transmit and process information using light. We needed to learn how to control light on a tiny microchip, and that seemed inconceivable 15 years ago. Today, our ability to control light is incredible. It is behind the technology in every data center, and it is enabling new fundamental studies of light-matter interaction. I'd like to thank John Janopoulos for his mentorship throughout my whole career. I'd like to thank Margaret Menane for her guidance and for serving as an inspiration uh, to me for my career. I want to thank my husband and my two sons who fill me with pride and joy. 
daily. This award is for my mother, who believed life should be taken by the horns. And it's for my father, who's sitting here. He encouraged my twin sister and myself to pursue physics, only physics. <laughs> but most important, he encouraged us to see well beyond the conventions of our traditional upbringings in Brazil. May we all see beyond conventions and continue to open the doors of science. Next, we'll have the National Academy of Sciences Award in Molecular Biology. This will be introduced by Bonnie Bartel, who chaired the selection committee. So it's my pleasure today to introduce the award in molecular biology to, uh, that's going to be awarded to David Reich at Harvard Medical School for his creative use of molecular biology to trace ancient human migrations, to reveal how population mixtures shaped modern humans, and to illuminate disease risk factors across populations. Um, I'd like to thank the Academy for this great honor, um, and also especially for the honor for this new field of using ancient DNA sequences extracted from human remains to learn about history and biology. This technology only came online really in 2010 when the first ancient whole genome data sets were generated from humans. And since that time, more than 2,000 whole genome sequences have been published by many laboratories. Um, and um, for me, this is a great honor, but also it's a recognition of the importance of this field, which is showing us that many things that we thought about the past are wrong and that we're connected to each other humanly and to peoples in the past in many ways not previously imagined. I wanted to thank very much all of the people in my laboratory, I haven't ever written a single paper by myself. In particular, Nick Patterson, who's a statistical geneticist I've worked with extremely closely since 2001. Nadine Rowland, who is a molecular biologist with whom uh, who I built the wet laboratory where we do ancient DNA analysis. And Shap Malik, who I do, who has worked on all the computational work in my laboratory and developed a lot of the approaches we use to analyzing data. Um, I wanted to thank my family, um, Leah, Seth, Eugenie, uh, who are here, my parents, uh, Danny, uh, my parents, Tova and Walter, and my um, brother, Danny, sister-in-law, Amy, uh, and uh, uh, niece and nephew, Simon and Josie. Thank you. Uh, our, our next award is the Selman A. Waxman Award in Microbiology. This will be introduced by Jeffrey I. Gordon, who chaired the selection committee. On behalf of the selection committee, I'm delighted to present Sharon uh, Long the Steer Pfizer Professor of Biological Sciences at Stanford University as this year's recipient of this award. First given 51 years ago, um, this award is named after a biochemist and microbiologist um, who systematically studied soil microbes and discovered streptomycin, um, the first effective treatment for tuberculosis. In this context of soil and microbes, it's particularly fitting that this year's award go to Sharon Long, who's being recognized for her pioneering research defining the molecular mechanisms underlying the important nitrogen-fixing symbiosis between rhizobium and legumes, research 
that has had major implications for microbe host interactions in general. Dr. Long is being recognized as a towering figure in the field for her career and for contributions that have been a source of inspiration to many others. And as noted in the award, um, whose work has implications that are extremely broad and impactful for many disciplines, including characterization of the chemical communications that occur between pathogenic bacteria and their hosts. Well, thank you uh, to the committee, to the academy. Um, it's wonderful to, to work on symbiosis. Uh, it's amazing to discover the intricate ways in which uh, a host and microbe uh, communicate the molecular conversations and cellular gymnastics that they go through as they create a, a whole novel organ in which cells of both kinds adopt fates, acquire new fates that they are very far from their origin. Symbiosis is also a wonderful metaphor for life and for work. Makes me very aware of connections, communities. I feel very blessed by family and friends by the network of love and support uh, that they have brought and to my husband Gilbert Chu who's here today to our kids to family uh, to friends across the years thank you every day thank you my teachers formed my life and my thinking my mentors and colleagues helped launch me in this field and continue to provide all the time great examples of terrific science and fairness. They, they're always an inspiration. And great thanks to the members of my lab, students, postdocs, staff. Uh, their work is what has made this recognition possible, along with the work of an entire field of people who study symbiosis and microbe host interactions in general. I'm grateful for all these communities and hope I will represent them well in, in accepting this award. Thank you. And now the Artoski Medal. This will be introduced by Jonathan I. Lunin, who's representing the Selection Committee. I'm very pleased to be able to present the Artowski Medal uh, to Dr. Michelle Thompson, uh, who has not only made remarkable contributions in the area of the Earth's magnetosphere, but also worked on uh, the magnetospheres of Jupiter and Saturn, all the way from the very first explorations of uh, those systems with pioneers 10 and 11 in the early 1970s to uh, the Cassini mission, uh, which was really a, a remarkable accomplishment in a number of areas, uh, especially that of magnetospheres. And so I'm very pleased uh, to uh, present the 2019 Artowski Medal to Dr. Michelle F. Thompson of the Planetary Sciences Institute and Los Alamos National Laboratory for her seminal contributions to determining the fundamental physics of collisionless shocks in space plasmas and the understanding of the dynamics of the magnetospheres of Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn. Thank you very much. Uh, much as it might, I might like it to be, this isn't about me, because doing research with spacecraft measurements is not a lone wolf operation. Indeed, it really does take a whole village to accomplish. From the people who first developed the mission concept and convince others that it's a compelling and feasible approach, to the technicians and engineers who turn the concepts into complex instruments capable of surviving the stress of the launch and the harsh environment of space for many years, to the people who build and fly the spacecraft 
to the programmers who will convert the bits returned from space into physically meaningful numbers, and to the scientific colleagues who share their ideas and understanding and help refine your own. So on behalf of all of those amazing and talented people who make this research possible, I gratefully accept this award. Next, we have the G.K. Warren Prize. This will be introduced by Dennis V. Kent, Chair of the Selection Committee. It's my great pleasure to uh, present the 2019 G.K. Warren Prize to uh, Anna K. Berensmeyer on behalf of the Selection Committee. She's at the Smithsonian Institution and has done seminal work looking at uh, sedimentary sequences, many of which contain hominid remains and provided a very important framework for, sedimentological framework for these, uh, for these studies. So in this award, she's being recognized for a contribution to understanding fluvial processes, how they are expressed in the rock record, and how they shape our understanding of ecological change throughout the history of life on land. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Dennis. I offer my sincere thanks to the selection committee and the nominators as well who decided that I was worthy of this great honor and also to the family of G.K. Warren. I grew up on the West, in western Illinois beside the Mississippi River, and both modern and ancient rivers have shaped my professional life. So it is especially wonderful to be recognized for research about how rivers interact with life over time. Luna Leopold, a pioneer in fluvial geomorphology and one of the first recipients of the G.K. Warren Prize, played a pivotal role in my early career. I was curious about how bones uh, are transported by rivers. He said, if you don't understand something, measure it and invited me to release my bones into his experimental river in Wyoming. This led to a lot of wonderful discoveries. And through Luna, I also met Thomas Dunn, another Warren Prize recipient, and that connection led to a 40-plus year study of bone taphonomy, that's how bones are destroyed and preserved in a modern ecosystem in East Africa. Many other mentors, colleagues and students, as well as a supportive family, a number of whom are here today, have contributed to my quest to understand how environments affect ecology and evolution. I could not be standing here without them, and I sincerely thank all of them. I am immensely grateful and deeply honored to accept the G.K. Warren Prize. And now the National Academy of Sciences Award for Scientific Reviewing. This will be introduced by C. Megan Yuri, who chaired the selection committee. It's my pleasure and honor to present the 2019 National Academy of Sciences Award for Scientific Re Reviewing, which really means writing the best review articles, not reviewing other people's articles. <laughs> Um, um, it's presented in the field of astronomy for only the third time in more than 30 years, so this is the best article of the past decade or more. And on behalf of the committee, which included Jocelyn Bell Burnell, Catherine Cesarski, Andrea Gez, Martha Haynes, and Lyman Page, I can report we were delighted to recognize an outstanding scholar and leader whose foundational work on star formation and gas in galaxies led to uh, stimulated major progress in galaxy evolution. The award goes to Robert C. Kennicutt, Jr. of the University of Arizona and Texas A&M University, and his citation states, for the highly cited review, star formation in galaxies along the Hubble sequence and related work synthesizing the broad field of stellar formation 
which provided a critical intellectual foundation for the field. Thank you very much. I will confess, Meg, I was one of those scientists who thought the award was for reviewing <laughs> other people's papers. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> Everybody, uh, of course, wants to make an impact in the field, but I never would have dreamed uh, early in my career that uh, of the things I've done, the one that is the most recognized is actually a review paper where people can go to measure star formation in galaxies or where a graduate student who's new to the field can go uh, to learn about the subject for the first time. Uh, so it's a, a really deep honor to me, although I have to say every time I get another citation into the article, there's a reward there because I know uh, that a colleague is actually using my work to advance their own field. In terms of acknowledgments, since it's a, re a, a reward for a review paper, I should thank the hundreds of colleagues whose work I reviewed. <laughs> but I've only got about 100 words left. Uh, so I do want to, I'm going to use the time uh, instead of the Oscar speech to wave the flag for uh, review papers uh, themselves. I, I do fear. Um, the, uh, for the future of review articles, at least in my subject. We all know that the, the, the number and volume of, of papers in science uh, is growing explosively, and I think that means that uh, quality reviews are more important than ever. But at the same time, the character of scientific publication is evolving so that in fields like ours, for example, one of the prime sources of reviews, uh, conference proceedings, are on the verge of extinction, uh, again, at least in the subjects uh, where I work. So I think uh, they're worth fighting to preserve, and I have to thank the Academy, first of all, for honoring me with the award, but also for taking the lead in recognizing the importance of uh, this uh, component of our literature. Uh, thanks very much. Next up, we have the National Academy of Sciences Award in Chemical Sciences. This will be introduced by John C. Tully, who will be representing the Selection Committee. So the NAS Award in Chemical Sciences is awarded to Professor Jacqueline Barton of California Institute of Technology for her groundbreaking work on the chemistry or the chemical properties of DNA. She has designed and made small molecules, transition metal complexes that bind to specific sites in DNA and with a um, fidelity that rivals that of, of uh, proteins and has used these as probes, optical probes, um, and as uh, chemically reactive centers that she can put where she wants to, and um, which has revolutionized some of the understanding of, of DNA. In addition, she's uh, pioneered work on electron transport across DNA strands um, and its implications to, um, to uh, DNA repair and also to long-range communication within cells. Uh, her work has stimulated an enormous amount of uh, work in this area. So the citation for her reads, for her pioneering contributions to our understanding of the chemical, biological, and spectroscopic properties of the DNA double helix. Well, thank you, and, and I just want to say it's a real honor uh, to receive this award. Um, my work is about basic research, and I know everyone here uh, knows the importance of basic research. We started out looking at simple metal complexes and how they interact with DNA, and then electron transfer between these metal complexes, and next thing you know, uh, now we're looking at, at DNA repair and DNA replication. Um, so. I really want to thank uh, my students and postdocs uh, who've worked in my lab throughout the years uh, because it's really 
uh, their courage and their commitment um, that led us along this journey, um, asking questions, learning new things that we didn't know the answers to, and, and learning a little bit about how the way the world works. Um, so they're really the important ones uh, deserving of this award, the basis for this award. And I also want to thank my family who are here today, because uh, they make everything better. Um, and again, uh, my, my deep thank you uh, for this honor. Thanks very much. Okay, now up is the Richard Lounsbury Award. It will be introduced by Hopi Hoekstra, who chaired the selection committee. Hi, it's my great pleasure uh, to present the 2019 Lounsbury Award to Jay Sindure. So I wanted to just tell you a brief anecdote. So after receiving and reviewing um, nominations, the committee convened. It was comprised of both American and French scientists. Immediately, one of our French colleagues proclaimed emphatically and in a heavy French accent, which I will not replicate here, it is not possible to choose just one winner, especially in the time you allotted. There were murmurs of agreement, but as chair, Although I agreed, I had no choice but to lead the committee forward. Despite an unbelievable team of nominees, uh, a pool of nominees, what was so remarkable was how so quickly, smoothly, and unanimously, we, a diverse and critical committee, honed in on uh, this year's recipient, Jay Sindori. So, uh, Jay Sindori of the University of Washington, for his pioneering work and leadership in the second wave of genomics that is transforming genetics and medicine. Through his development of exome sequencing and other novel technologies, he has defined new paradigms for implicating Mendelian disease genes, interpreting genetic variation, and single cell profiling of developmental lineages and gene regulation in whole organisms. Congratulations and thank you for making my job so easy. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hopi, and the selection committee. I'd also like to thank the Academy um, and uh, the Richard uh, Lounsbury Foundation for making this award possible. Um, so it's been an been um, extraordinary time in our field of, of genetics and genomics. Uh, I, I caught the technology bug as a, as a graduate student, and um, to watch some of these new methods go from you know, a, a handful of basis uh, gathered over the course of a week to, you know, uh, billion, billion fold improvements uh, really in, in a decade has been um, uh, a real fun ride and as well as to see is what these technologies have, have enabled. Um, I've had the privilege of, of being mentored by some very different individuals. Uh, so Lee Silver, a, uh, a classic uh, mammalian geneticist, uh, George Church, uh, who always thinks out of the box, and um, Bob Waterston, uh, who is a pioneer in genomics. And I think uh, in addition to kind of teaching me or mentoring me across these, these various disciplines, um, each of them really also uh, taught me a lot about how to be as a scientist, if that makes sense, uh, in a way that was um, entirely uh, consistent and, and formative. Um, I'd like to, uh, above all, thank my lab. Uh, the work that the award is recognizing is, is um, only partly my own and, and uh, really um, a credit to a brilliant group of individuals, both past and present, who um, did all the work that's being, being recognized. Uh, my, my family, uh, my parents, and my, my brother Rahul for their unflagging support over uh, four decades uh, as I kind of tried to pursue a, a career in science, um, uh, which was not kind of what, what my family historically has, had, had um, uh, established careers in. And um, my wife, Alex, who's, who's here, uh, and my three kids, uh, Aria, uh, Daniel, and Benjamin, uh, for their extraordinary love and support um, and for making life uh, awesome. So thank you for this award, and uh, I appreciate it. So 
Hopi just described uh, the difficulty that her committee was having in narrowing it down to just one recipient for the Lounsbury Award. Well, fortunately, the, for the next award, the Trolland Research Award, they didn't have to narrow it down to just one. They have two recipients for this award, and each will be introduced separately by Marlene Berman, who chaired the selection committee. Thank you. It's been a great honor chairing the selection committee and witnessing the numerous submissions, all of which attest to the value of rigorous psychological science. The Trolland Award is given to investigators under the age of 40 engaged in experimental psychology. There is a preference for experimental work with a quantitative bias and for investigations that engage multiple methods. Trolland himself took an interest in what was called psychic research, and he was one of the first scientists to use a machine, in his case, a lamp, to study, amongst other things, mental telepathy. I think Trolland would have been delighted to see how far we have come both in topics and techniques, as evidenced by the work of our two awardees. Our first awardee is Dr. Adriana Galvin of the University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Galvin has made pioneering discoveries about brain development in children with an eye toward informing policy on juvenile justice and related issues. Her citation recognizes her for her experimental advances characterizing the neurobiological mechanisms underlying adaptive and risky adolescent behavior, elucidating theoretical models of adolescence, and the impact of this research on decisions of juvenile justice. Dr. Galvin. Thank you, Marlene, and the Trolland Award uh, Committee for this award. I'm deeply honored to be receiving an award for work I have the privilege of doing. I gratefully recognize that my research is the product of hard work of members of my laboratory, generous funding, and also the guidance of my mentors. I first thank the public school teachers of my hometown of Santa Barbara, California, for sparking my interest in science. I thank my extraordinary and influential PhD advisor, B.J. Casey, for challenging me to pursue research questions even when the path forward wasn't always clear. It is this that led me to pursue research on the adolescent brain. I thank her for creating a stimulating environment and for her unwavering support at every stage of my career. I thank my postdoctoral mentor, Russell Poldrack, for serving as a model of how to rigorously and elegantly challenge assumptions. And finally, I mostly thank my family. I'm grateful that my parents, Nicolas and Adolfa Galvan, are here today by my side, as always, for their unconditional love and support. I thank my caring sisters for their friendship. And to my, I thank my children, for uh, Lucia and Gustavo, for their humor and for asking me the really tough questions. Um, harder than some reviewers sometimes. And to the brilliant, fearless, and kind scientist, Bill Lowry, my husband, thank you for your profound commitment to my career and to our family. Our second awardee is Dr. Tom Griffiths of Princeton University. Dr. Griffiths combines behavioral and computer science to provide a greater understanding of both human cognition and machine learning. His research examines and characterizes both optimal decision making as well as the reasons why people deviate from the optimal. He is being recognized today for his pioneering work bringing the methods of Bayesian inference to bear on understanding a broad range of cognitive functions from perception to language to
decision-making, reasoning, and cognitive control, and for bringing formal rigor to the notion of bounded rationality, explaining apparent irrationalities of behavior in fully rational terms. Dr. Griffiths. Thank you. It's a, it's a real honor to receive this award, particularly because when I look at the list of past recipients, I see many of the people who inspired me to become a cognitive scientist. So I'd like to thank the people who got me here, my family, Rod and Judy, who uh, my parents traveled from Australia to be here today uh, with my children, my daughters, Ollie and Annika, who are here in the audience, uh, and my wife, Tanya, who uh, appropriately is giving a keynote at another scientific meeting today. <laughs> Uh, as well as my mentors, Josh Tenenbaum, who uh, pitched my graduate application out of a pile and decided that some kid from the other side of the earth was the right person to take as his first graduate student, uh, and my collaborators and my wonderful students. Last year, one of those students, Cheyenne Gull, uh, who was an undergraduate in my laboratory, died suddenly on the way to a conference where he was going to be presenting his research. Uh, and we created a fund in his name to support the research of other exceptional undergraduates. And part of the funds from this award will go to support those students. Thank you. I really love hearing stories like that. Really good use. Anyway, the next is the NAS Award in the Neurosciences. It will be introduced by Leslie B. Vossall, who chaired the selection committee. It's my great pleasure on behalf of the committee to present to Eve Martyr of Brandeis University the 2019 NAS Award in the Neurosciences. Eve is great. Eve is unique. The committee decided that she has no scientific twin, meaning that her work in the neurosciences really is entirely original. You can't find anybody else working in this area. Her discovery that the nervous system can adapt to environmental insults and stress by homeostatic regulation of ion channels is both profound and influential. She's also been a leader in helping young scientists think about how to do science and how to think about science. So for her body of work that has transformed the perception of neuronal circuits, as static structures well described by connectivity diagrams to our current understanding of microcircuits as flexible and dynamic entities that efficiently balance the needs for plasticity and stability, I present to you Eve Martyr. So I'd like to thank um, the selection committee, but most importantly, I'd like to thank the many, many thousands of lobsters and crabs that have <laughs> sacrificed their lives to science. Now, you might think this is funny, but I'm really dead serious because every time we got stuck, I would always tell my students and postdocs to go ask the crab or go ask the lobster. And I think there's something very profound in knowing that there are secrets of the universe and secrets of life that animals know and it's our job to find. Now, before leaving you, I do want to thank my um, graduate and postdoc um, advisors, Alan Silverston, David Barker, and Jacques Sukio, who all three of them had enough sense to stay out of my way. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's true. They were really quite remarkable. They gave me all, all the rope and all the, the time to do what I wanted. And then, of course, everything wonderful I ever have ever done in the lab is because I had really, really talented, creative, and innovative graduate students and postdocs. And everything new came from one of them. And then finally, I would like to thank my wonderful husband, Arthur Wingfield, who's a cognitive neuroscientist, who not only is a saint, but additionally, I think he really taught me how to write. And so I would like to thank him for all the, the early work he, he gave me in trying to 
learn how to craft a really good manuscript. So, thank you. All right, now we have the National Academy of Sciences Award for Chemistry in Service to Society. This award will be introduced by Joseph S. Francisco, who chaired the selection committee. Thank you, Marcia. I have mine on the cell phone. <laughs> on behalf of the selection committee, I'm delighted to present the NAS Award for Chemistry to Service to Society to John C. Martin of Gilead Sciences Incorporated. This award recognizes John's contributions to the development of antiviral medications used to treat even the most refractory of the deadly diseases, including HIV AIDS, HCV, HBV, CMV, and flu, impacting hundreds of millions of individuals around the world, and for his tireless efforts to ensure all of humanity, rich and poor alike, benefit from these innovations. John. Thanks, Joe. Uh, it, I'm very honored by this award and appreciate the selection committee for it. When I started working in antivirals 40 years ago as a sole laboratory scientist, the field hardly existed. There were trivial medications. And in fact, there wasn't even HIV, if you can imagine. It was prior to uh, us needing to de deal with the HIV epidemic. Because it was such a nascent field, I quickly acquired a few collaborators that have been on this journey. Uh, it's a journey of a lifetime, really, with me. A number of them are in the room today. And uh, it is the collaboration that's allowed us to make all the advances we've had over the last few decades and to help bring not only discover and develop, but bring the products to the world. So I'm grateful. I thank you all. I especially thank the people who have worked with me all these years. Uh, and thank you very much for this uh, DuPont Award. Thank you. All right. Uh, now we have the Alexander Hollander Award in Biophysics. It will be introduced by Wa Chu, who chaired the selection committee. On behalf of the selection committee, it's my honor to present Professor Jen Richardson for the year's award in uh, Alexander Hollander Award in Biophysics. Jen has made innovative contributions to assess quality and accuracy of macromolecular structures through the development of methods for the analysis, representation, and validations of atomic models. Her ribbon diagram representations of highly convoluted and complex three-dimensional topology of protein structure have made them easily understandable and comprehensible not only for experts, but the entire scientific community at large. I personally benefit and being inspired by Jen's work throughout this year. Jen, we thank you very much. Yes. So I feel very enormously pleased, honored, and empowered by the Hollander Award. Biophysics is indeed how I think about my research and about my half century of working at Duke jointly with my husband, Dave, who's there in the audience. And it's been a great ride doing what we really cared about and loved. Uh, 
Also, my first national meeting in many sense was the Biophysical Society. So, on our joint careers, we've changed directions often, but always to try to better understand these elegant, complex protein structures and nucleic acid structures. So we did early crystal structures of proteins. Uh, we learned from what didn't work in early protein design. It was all negative, but really informative. Uh, we got to name neat features like Greek key folds and helix caps and, and uh, RNA backbone conformers, um, developing the ribbon diagrams and computer graphics representations. And then, uh, been a while now, but it seems like the most recent direction, was adding all the hydrogens uh, to study atomic contacts. And those hydrogens pulled us into a very strange business of structure validation. It's not a good way to make friends. <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately, it's satisfying when the structures really get better. And people begin to realize that it will make them better. Uh, so my overall thoughts going away from this are you should feel free to change directions, collaborate, share ideas. Uh, and if you do do structures, please use malprobity and make them better. <laughs>
of experimental extraterrestrial organic chemistry and the beginnings of experimental inquiry into the origin of life. I am pleased and proud to represent him. Thank you. All right, now the Pradle Research Award. It will be introduced by Nicholas C. Spitzer, who represents the Selection Committee. Uh, thank you, Marcia. It is a great pleasure on behalf of the uh, Pradell Research Award Committee uh, to present this year's award to Lee Chun Lo from Stanford University. Uh, Lee Chun, uh, in his pioneering work in developing genetic mosaic methods, has revolutionized the study of diverse biological processes. These include cell fate specification and cell morphogenesis. And he has gone on to use these uh, methods to obtain insight into the development of wiring specificity in the nervous systems of both vertebrates and invertebrates. Congratulations, Yuli Chen. I'd like to thank uh, Nick, the Selection Committee, and the National Academy of Sciences for this great honor. Also, I'd like to thank my PhD advisor and postdoctoral advisor, Kalpana White and Yunnan Jen, for their education. And particularly, I'd like to thank students and postdoctoral fellows in my lab at Stanford who have uh, contributed to the work that's uh, been cited in the award. I also want to give a shout out for using simple model organisms, such as fruit flies, to understand the fundamental principles that govern the development and the function of more complex mammalian brains, including our own. Finally, I'm happy to note that a Prudell Research Award is given to a mid-career neuroscientist, which hopefully means that I still have some exciting discoveries ahead. <laughs> Our next award is the NAS Award for Scientific Discovery. It will be introduced by Rachel Green, who chaired the Selection Committee. I'm very happy to represent our committee today to present the 2019 NAS Award for Scientific Discovery to Zhaowei Zhang of Harvard University for her pioneering contributions to the development of super-resolution imaging and genomic scale imaging methods. Xiaowei's work really extends from physics to biology and is allowing us to see with unprecedented um, vision the inner workings of the cell. Congratulations, Xiaowei. Yeah. Uh... I'm deeply honored to receive this NS Award uh, for Scientific Discovery. And I would like to share this honor with all my former and current uh, students and uh, postdocs. Uh, truly, uh, working with these uh, talented and dedicated young scientists uh, is the most rewarding experience that I've ever had. And together, we explored the beautiful molecular world of uh, living systems uh, using the imaging methods we developed. I would also like to thank my wonderful collaborators. It's a real joy, a shared joy working together with them with uh, shared enthusiasm for uh, science and for the systems that we work together on. And I would like to thank the award committee, uh, Rachel Green and other committee members for selecting to honor our work. And finally, last but not least, I would like to thank my loving family for their unwavering support for the past many years. Thank you. Next is the National Academy of Sciences Prize in Food and Agricultural Research. This will be introduced by Mary Lou Guirino, Chair of the Selection Committee.
I'm very happy today to be able to uh, present the uh, 2019 Food and Agricultural Sciences Award to Elizabeth Ainsworth of the USDA Agricultural Research Service. Today, we are uh, honoring Lisa for her pioneering research, unraveling how anthropogenic atmospheric changes affect the physiology and growth of crops, and for being a science ambassador and a role model for the next generation of scientists. By awarding Lisa the Food and Agriculture Prize today, we hope to promote the message that climate change is real and must be addressed if we are indeed to have a future. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I'm humbled to be here, and I'd like to thank the National Academy of Sciences, the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, uh, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for this award. I would also like to thank the USDA Agricultural Research Service support for supporting my career, as well as the truly synergistic partnership between the University of Illinois and the USDA ARS that supported long-term research that's allowed us to um, do, the, do the work. I'm very grateful for a terrific mentorship from all of my colleagues at the USDA ARS and the University of Illinois, um, especially Steve Long and Don Wart. Um, I'm not receiving this award for anything that I did alone, and I thank all of the wonderful students, postdocs, and collaborators who have worked with me. My family supports me every single day, and I thank you very much for that. Um, I'm not receiving this award, or I am receiving this award, award in large part because I've had the great privilege and op of opportunities to share my research with the general public, from camps serving junior high girls, to hosting citizen scientists, to meeting farmers and reporters. If we are to tackle the grand challenges of agriculture, adapting crops to global climate change, reducing the environmental impact of agriculture, and nutritiously feeding a growing population, we need the support of the public. To gain that support, we must engage and offer meaningful dialogue, and we have to have solutions. So I'm excited to keep working on this challenge, and thank you very much. And now we have the Michael and Sheila Held Prize. It will be introduced by Richard M. Karp, who chaired the selection committee. The Michael and Sheila Held Prize is awarded to Ola Svensson of EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland for breakthroughs in combinatorial optimization and graph theoretic algorithms, culminating in the first constant factor approximation algorithm for the asymmetric traveling salesman problem. The, the award is uh, particularly appropriate in this case, because one of the donors of the award, the late Michael Held, did early research on exactly this problem that uh, Ola eventually uh, conquered. The traveling salesman problem asks for the shortest route through a, uh, to visit all of the uh, cities in a given set given travel costs between each pair of cities. It is a so-called NP-complete problem, which means that um, we do not believe that there exists an efficient general algorithm for solving it optimally. And so attention is turned instead to approximation algorithms. In the symmetric version of the problem, in which the travel cost from A to B is the same as the travel cost from B to A, there has been progress and uh, there, uh, for some time, a good approximation algorithm, although possibly not the best approximation algorithm, um, has been known. But the asymmetric problem, in which the cost of going one way is not necessarily the same as the cost of its reversal, it has been extremely challenging to find approximation algorithms, 
and it was Ola and his research group using insights from his previous work on the symmetric problem that led through a series of intricate reductions to a constant factor approximation algorithm for the asymmetric traveling salesman problem. Okay. I'm incredibly honored to receive this recognition for work uh, that I simply love to do. So as we have tried to illustrate, and as Karp very well explained, I'm working on narrowing the gap of our understanding of what efficient computation can accomplish. And my favorite problem is indeed the traveling salesman problem. So I would like to start by thanking the Hull family and Natural Academy of Sciences for making this prize possible. I would also like to thank my nominators, Dick and the whole selection committee, well, for selecting me. I feel also very fortunate to work in a field where the leaders, even the founders, like Dick and others, have always been very approachable, helpful, and encouraging. This amazingly open and friendly culture has a great impact on my career development. Other important factors uh, have been, of course, my amazing co-authors, great colleagues, and superb mentors. I would like to mention three mentors by name. My uh, mathematics high school teacher, Petter from Forsmark Skola, my PhD advisor, Monaldo Mastrolilli, and my postdoc advisor, Johan Haustad. I can only aspire to be an equally good advisor to the amazing students that I now have at EPFL. Finally, I cannot leave the stage without acknowledging my wonderful family, my wife, Dana, my daughter, Yael, I love you. My parents and my siblings, I think they are my greatest supporters, greatest teachers, and sometimes also my greatest competitors. So <laughs> thank you all. I'm really proud and very happy. And on. And now we have tonight's final award. It is the National Academy of Sciences Public Welfare Medal. It will be introduced by Susan R. Wessler, the Academy's Home Secretary. The 2019 National Academy of Sciences Public Welfare Medal is awarded to Agnes Calabata, agricultural scientist, policymaker, and visionary leader who is currently president of AGRA, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. The Public Welfare Medal, which was established in 1914, is the highest honor of the National Academy of Sciences and is presented annually by the Council of the Academy in recognition of distinguished contributions in the application of science to the public welfare. The citation for Agnes Kalibata reads as follows for her work to drive Africa's agricultural transformation through modern science and effective policy, helping to lift more than a million Rwandans out of poverty and scaling impacts for millions more African farmers. And because this is our last award and uh, the most prestigious of the NAS awards, I'm given a little bit more time to introduce our recipient, and Dr. Kalibata has a little bit more time uh, to present. So short bio, Dr. Kalibata was born in Rwanda and raised as a refugee in Uganda to parents who were smallholder farmers. This upbringing had a profound impact on the direction of her life. She writes, quote, occasionally my father would sell a cow and this little income helped put me through school. Uh, though the aspiration was that I would move as far from agriculture as possible as fortune would have it, I've spent my entire career in it. It's the page here. All right. She earned her bachelor's degree in entomology and biochemistry, followed by a master's degree in agriculture, both from Makariri University in Uganda. Kali Bada received a, a doctorate in entomology from the University of Massachusetts Amherst in 2005. From 2004 to 2014, she returned to Rwanda to, as she writes, put her knowledge to work back in her home country, where she served as first 
permanent secretary, then minister of state, and ultimately minister for agriculture and animal resources. During this time, she was the architect of a remarkable transformation. Quoting from the nomination letter from Dr. Robert Horsch, who's dep who was, newly retired, deputy director of agricultural research and development at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, Rob said, in Rwanda, most farmers earn their living from less than a hectare of land. Nonetheless, the country has moved from not producing enough food for its people to being nearly self-sufficient, due in large part to changes made under the leadership of Dr. Kalibata. Successful implementation of policies which increased agricultural efficiency and productivity led to tremendous progress for the country, including significant poverty reduction, increased market opportunities for small farmholders, and fewer malnourished children. Since 2014, Dr. Kalibata has been president of the Alliance of Agra, an African-led organization founded by former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. As president, she leads a staff of more than 2,000 across 11 priority countries, one of the largest pools of agricultural scientists, uh, scientists and specialists in Africa, and works with global, regional, and national partners to drive a portfolio of, of investments worth more than half a billion dollars. Agra's goal is to improve the food security and, in, and incomes of 30 million farming households in the 11 countries by 2021. Agra's focus has been on strengthening systems and tools to support Africa's agriculture, such as high quality seeds, better soil health, access to markets and credit, and on strengthening farmer organizations, private sector capacity and agricultural policy. She is or has been a member of numerous boards and international committees, including the Global Agenda Council of the World Economic Forum, the Global Panel for Agriculture and Food Systems for Nutrition, the Global Agriculture and Food Security Program Steering Committee, and finally, the Global Commission on the Economy and Climate. She is also a recipient of several awards, including the Yara Award for, Af for African Green Ev Revolution in 2012. I'm going to end with a um, uh, short from a, a quote, a note that was received, um, I think, by Rob Horsch from Pierre Camari Munyari, who was chairman of the Coffee Exporters and Processor Association of Rwanda. He says, on my farm where we grow Arabica beans, we rely on science and technology. We use GPS tools to monitor our land and social media to trade information faster than ever before. We use crop protection products to drive away pests. One day I hope that we'll even have access to GMO coffee that could help us resist disease and drought in an area of climate change, in an, in an era of climate change. These innovations are still a long way off, but we'll never enjoy them if we don't at least start to think about them now. The political will of the government of Rwanda to support the farmers is a big opportunity, and recognizing a Rwandan national on the international scene is a recognition of Rwanda as a country that has been working hard to eradicate famine and hunger. And he ended by saying, something tells me that the Public Welfare Medal is not the last prize you'll ever receive. And the committee agrees. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sue. Thank you for this recognition. Uh, but listening to all the recognitions that have gone out today morning, I noticed two things. One, that I'm among very good company. Two, that I miss the lab. You, <laughs> you all are doing fabulous work, and I really, really, really miss the lab. It's, uh, it's amazing to see the amount of work that is being done here. So I really want to thank the National Academy of Science for recognizing the work that we are doing. I also wanted to thank Rob, I've seen him in the audience, for nominating me and other people who uh, contributed to this nomination. My life with the agricultural sector in in, uh, uh, has been extremely exciting, like Sue mentioned. It's been very interesting. I started out at a point where, again, like she said, I grew up in a refugee camp. 
And my sense and understanding of agriculture, probably something that strengthened my understanding of uh, my appreciation of agriculture, is that if it was not for agriculture first, we wouldn't have had the food we had, but we also would not have been able to go to school. My dad had quite a number of kids, 15 in all. I know my sister is here and will not be happy hearing me say that. <laughs> but we were 15 and he sent all of us to school just because he farmed. He did farm and he sent us to school using a few cows that he made here and there. But I also learned something very quickly. When I started working in the agricultural sector, I came across this lady in uh, Tanzania, Fatima. Fatima had five daughters, and by the time we reached her, all the five daughters she had were married. And we were reaching her because I was working in Agra, and Agra had an improved crop of cow pea that was quadrupling four times, getting helping farmers produce four times as much as they had been producing when they were using land races. Talk about uh, basic science. Elizabeth doesn't become more basic than this. So Eliza, uh, this lady produces, Fatima produces uh, four times as much, and she didn't seem as happy as we thought she would be. And the question, when I asked her what the problem was, she said, if I had got this crop um, a few years ago, I would not have married off my daughters very young. I would have sent each of them to school. And for me, that resonated very well. Not because I could have been any of her daughters, but because I had seen so many farmers making those type of choices while I grew up. But it, the most important thing that this message brought to me was the sense of urgency that was required when you work in the agricultural sector in Africa. While this science that we are getting to farmers is extremely basic, it is also extremely transformative. It means a difference between a kid going to school and being able to have a life like I did, coming from a refugee camp, but also from a small farming household, or being married very early and getting lost in poverty. It's extremely important. At AGRA, and with a number of institutions we work with, I've seen a number of colleagues here from the CGIR, from the CGIR. people have dedicated their lives to produce better varieties for these farmers. We are trying to get them out to farmers as fast as we can. But for me, there's a real sense of urgency as to how quickly we get these things to farmers. In Rwanda, I was extremely fortunate to work under a president that basically urgency is his second nature. Everything has to be done yesterday. Seriously, I mean, <laughs> how else do you account for a country like Rwanda being where it is today, 25 years after the genocide that happened in Rwanda? Urgency is second nature to President Kagame. So I was lucky that he had a number of policies in place that worked very well. And this is where the recognition of science and policy really comes in that, uh, that you mentioned, Sue. First of all, he recognized that science is extremely important to agriculture, and that's how I became Minister of Agriculture, because I'm a scientist. But also he, he appreciates women and what women do, and how well women do a good job once given the responsibility. So that's also how I ended up in the job. But then, really, really more importantly, for, for, for him, agriculture was one of the three sector, sectors that needed to be invested in. Number two, Rwanda had acquired a land registration system that allowed every smallholder farmer to own their land, which kind of liberated people, really, to be able to make choices around the land they owned. So when I came on board, we had to think of creative ways of producing on very small land holdings, 0.3 of a hectare, but also on very steep slopes. Rwanda is extremely, if you've been to Rwanda, it's a very steep country. Erosion is very high. And we have to think about how to use, how to produce more for these farmers, how to get them out of poverty, how to use what they have. And they had only two things, their land and their labor. How do you use this to transform their lives? So yes, we reached out to scientists in the CGIR and managed to get a few varieties that were suitable for Rwanda. We worked with the communities to understand how they were able to overcome some of the challenges they were having in terms of the terrain. But more importantly, 
It was the policies that the government put in place around land consolidation. Land consolidation is something Rwanda had to figure out to make our farmers bigger. With a farmer of 0.3 hectare, there's no market value around that farmer. So we, we told them, we, we started encouraging them to consolidate their land, to work as a collective. And as a collective, we had hundreds of hectares under maize. You could think it was Iowa, where you find, <laughs> seriously, where you find 2,000 hectares under a commodity. And these farmers then started see, seeing and feeling the market power of what they are doing. Farmers that were producing potatoes started seeing markets of potatoes come to them. Farmers that were producing maize started seeing markets of maize coming to them. And so on and so on. And we were very deliberate to think about which crop did well where, the comparative, competitive advantage of crops when it came to regions. So, but this was all anchored in the policy of the government. But we also quickly realized that with this type of collective nature of, of working with farmers, we could reach them with extension, we could reach them with improved seeds and fertilizers, and we could work against the, the, the nature that had been imposed on us by the size of the country. So we were able to move and move very quickly. So what we saw in Rwanda is really science coming together. It was very critical for farmers to be able to overcome the ability to produce, to produce, to move from 0 0.5 of a hectare to at least five tons. And with farmers producing two to three to five tons, three to five tons, in the same land where they are producing 0 0.5 tons, definitely you start feeling the energy of that production in the environment. You start feeling the vibrations of that energy in the environment. So this is something that we are taking, we are borrowing from Rwanda, but also from other countries like Ethiopia that have chosen to prioritize agriculture. Borrowing that energy that comes from the science of agriculture and, the, and combining it with policy and taking it to other countries, but also taking it alongside the urgency of delivery that, that you learn in a country like Rwanda. And using the work and the network that we have built at Agra, <coughs> We, we see that agriculture is going to have to be the center piece of how we transform Africa's lives. I mean, think about it. Every country on the continent, nearly every country on the continent has gone through some form of agricultural revolution. It's only in Africa where you still have 70% of the people depending on agriculture, but also those people don't really have access to superior varieties to improve their crops. We have 25% of the GDP in these countries come from agriculture, but they are using land races. And yet the power of agriculture to transform people's lives at that level is 11% better than or higher than any other sector. It has been demonstrated because it's inclusive. So there's an opportunity here. And I, again, speaking to my colleagues here in the audience, there's a real opportunity here. And talking about climate change, it was said earlier, there's a real urgency here. We, have, we had started seeing a major upward move towards transforming economies, towards better livelihoods for Africans because of agriculture and because of the science of agriculture. Today, though, climate change has come in and climate change is real. I live in Kenya, in East Africa, and we are in the midst of the long seasons and we have not seen a drop of rain. I was told when I was here that it started raining, but it's come three weeks late, and it's not going to be of any value because it will probably go a few weeks early. 10.7 million people are said to, if it doesn't really rain like we expect, they'll go hungry. We've seen cyclones in uh, Mozambique, Malawi, and Zimbabwe, and I was told while I was here that actually it, it, was, it happened again. 700,000 people in the first cyclone were displaced and so many other people died. There's a real sense of urgency here. Besides food security, there's a real sense of urgency now about saving lives and ensuring that we actually work with climate change to ensure that we stay on top of varieties that we already know, or superior varieties that give people good food. We've already done an amazing job. The CGIR has varieties that are resistant to drought. They have varieties that are, uh, can be able to deal with flooding. We already know the science. I think my biggest worry is, is we are not getting it out fast enough. As Norman Bolog said, he was here receiving this, this very award. 
we need to take these things to the farmer and we don't have the value of time on our side. We don't have time on our side. So I really wanted to applaud the efforts that are going into ensuring that varieties become available, new science becomes available as we have seen here. I want to applaud the CGIR, I want to applaud Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for the work and effort they put into supporting institutions that are staying on the cutting edge of science. We have recently, as Agra, entered into a partnership with um, Atlas AI, a startup in um, Silicon Valley, to help us deal with the satellite imagery and de data so that we can be able to provide more predictive analytics to our countries so that they can understand what is coming soon and be able to plan. But I'm saying all this because, again, like I said earlier, I think there's a real opportunity in our Mideast to use science for the benefit of mankind and use it faster. So I don't want to belabor the point. I, I'm 100% sure that you have, you understand what I'm saying. The, the institution I work for, Agra, like I said earlier, is really taking this work and hopefully we can be able to reach millions of farmers in a short period of time. So we will need your support to stay the course. We'll need the science to continue happening in the laboratories to bring new innovations to, to farmers. But as was said earlier, it's very clear that African farmers, as farmers elsewhere in the world, are not interested in innovations if innovations are not going to transform their lives. These innovations have to have a market of a sense of markets and how they get to markets. I think us as scientists also need to learn to step out of our comfort zones and talk to politicians and policymakers and private sector because these, these are the channels that take innovations to communities. Politicians can take them there very fast because they make the policies and private sector has a lot to gain from the resources, from the money they can make from innovations. So we need to st st you step out of our comfort zone, get out there and work with them to take innovations to farmers. I wanted to conclude really by recognizing NASA again for, the, for really bringing us forward, me, myself, as, as Agnes, but also the work we've done in Rwanda, recognizing the Rwandan farmers and their contribution to the world because this is a major contribution that farmers can actually get themselves out of poverty. Recognizing the work Agra has done, I also wanted to take the opportunity to recognize the partners that are behind Agra. Agra has put itself together as an African institution that recognizes the need to bring science and politics together or the political economy of science together and to use this to drive change on the continent. And there are a number of partners that have put their weight behind us to support the work that we do including uh, Rockefeller Foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, USAID, BMZ, and the DFID. And I just wanted to thank them for recognizing that sometimes it's very, very important to have an institution like Agra in place to drive the difficult conversation that happen, that need to happen on, on the African continent to get agriculture to farmers. I wanted to recognize my, my colleagues at Agra. You said it so, we have a collection of experts and scientists whose job every day is to think about how we reach the next Minister of Agriculture and how we help them move science forward. And I really wanted to, uh, to thank them for the work that they have, they have put into this. I know that uh, my late father would probably be surprised to see where I have ended in agriculture. I've been more drawn, <laughs> drawn to agriculture than stayed away because he, every time he found me trying to do something with my mom, he would say no. I'm not paying your school fees so that you can farm. <laughs> because for him, farming was about poverty. It was about poverty, and he didn't want me anywhere near that. And I'm sure many people who grew up my time had that same thing. He would, I'm sure he would be very surprised, but pro probably presently surprised that I've, I'm still around agriculture and have used the experience to try to move other people forward. I wanted to thank the Rockefeller Foundation for paying my fees. I mean, you must be wondering how did I get all this through school? I got through school because institutions and philanthropists like the Rockefeller Foundation existed. They paid my way through school and I was able to get a PhD at the University of Massachusetts working with Professor Roy Van Reich. 
who he was who is not here today but really uh, was extremely extremely he taught me how I thought I knew how to write I, I already had a masters but he took his time to teach me how to write just like I was telling you so taught me how to write and I, I appreciated uh, being a scientist being at the University of Massachusetts I wanted to thank my family my kids are here Kelly and Kyla are here these kids put up with my absence <laughs> I'm, I'm an absent mom <laughs> but I keep telling them that I'm doing a very good job <laughs> so, so I hope that <laughs> so I hope that today they actually do recognize do understand that I do a good job <laughs> Uh, I, I want to say that uh, without my sister, who's been my moral compass and professional compass, I would never have gotten where I got. You know, my dad paid the school fees, and, but he didn't know where I was going, to be honest with you. I mean, we were in a refugee camp, for goodness sake. He didn't know where I was headed. So my sister was always there. No, this is the school you need to go to. This is how you get there and all that. So I really appreciate the support that you gave me. It wouldn't have been possible for me to be here. My husband was, is not here today, but um, he's, he's with us, and he's extremely proud that we are, we are, I'm getting this award, and I really thank him for, for the support he gives us. I don't know if I've forgotten anybody, and I thank the Academy again for recognizing the work we've done. I thank um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation again for recognizing the work we do, and I thank you all for the support that you give us. And I thank all the scientists and all the people who came here today from the science world that I've worked with in different boards, in different places, that each, in, in, in their own way, each one of them believe in, in a, a better Africa, in a more transformed Africa, in a food secure Africa. And your work has been amazing in what you're trying to do. And I appreciate the work that you do on the continent. We are getting there. Thank you so much. I'd like to ask all of today's award and medal recipients to stand one more time and be recognized, please. You've been a wonderful audience. Please join us next at the garden party out on where the tents are out on the West Lawn for the garden party. Thank you all very much. <laughs>